Praise the Lord. I think we're recording this time. Welcome to School of the Bible, the mini Bible series, Exodus 15, 15, where we take 15 verses from the scriptures, from the Bible, and we uh, take 15 minutes to read them, think about them, let the Spirit of God apply them to our lives, and to recognize that God has something for us in every 15 sections within 15 minutes of the word that we read. So in Exodus chapter 1, we're reading from verses 1 through 15. And it says, Now these are the names of the children of Israel, which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with Jacob. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were seventy souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join with our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pythom, and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage, in mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they were made to serve was done with vigor. And the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives of whom and which the name of the one was Shifroth, and the name of the other was Pua. Now it's interesting in reading this, Exodus chapter 1, verses 1 through 15, that we must remember this is an oral history. This was communicated verbally from one generation to another generation in a style that is often called limerick or rhyme. Sometimes it's considered a uh, verbal sing-song that's kind of used sometimes to keep meter or tempo but it was done in a way in the Hebrew that today even so we can still see that it was accurate to the very degree with which each dot and tittle as we were told in Genesis or in Matthew is accurate so it's very interesting that you can have oral history that's communicated from one generation to another passed down and then written down and have it as accurate as though it had happened yesterday or today with written history. So this is what was said. This is what was communicated. This is what was given to Moses by the traditions that were passed down from one generation to another. And that story is what we have now. It's not just a story, but it's an oral history. It is factual. It is actual. It is something that evangelicals like to say inspired word of God, but God conspired in the heart of man to remember that, to give to the man who eventually wrote it down, that wrote on behalf of Moses, even as Moses may have been overseeing it as having a scribe to do it, and he oversought that person to do it. So it's credited to Moses as having written this. I don't think that Moses sat up on top of the mountain and wrote down everything that God said and that we got this. I mean, some people might say that, and in Jewish, I'm sure, literature and liturgy, there's some places where some rabbis have commented or made commentary of it to be that way. It's not true. Now, it's interesting that we do have 70 souls that came out of the land that was with Jacob. 70 souls that came from Jacob. 70 souls besides Joseph that had moved from Israel into Egypt. Now, we're told that it's possible there could be up to 6 million Jews that came out of Egypt. So, from 70 to 6 million, it's possible that's the number of people that had become quite frankly, Jews or children of Israel from the 
minor few that had left Israel, which are very much so these men that are described as heads of their household, being heads of their tribes, being the leaders of their community, being the ones that we have listed here as Reuben and Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad and Asher. And it's interesting to me because we find in the book of Revelation the names are there too. In other words, God knows whom he knows and he calls them by name. He doesn't suddenly say, hey, guess what? Down in, you know, America, sooner or later, there's going to come up some black Hebrews and they're going to change the name of what a Jew is to a Hebrew and a Hebrew is going to be somebody that came out of Africa. No, it's not. And it's not going to be somebody that goes, Yahooey, Kabooey, and uh, Snooey, and Louie, and Screwy. You know, and that's my name and that, you know, I delivered you out of Egypt and I'm really, you know, the name I want you to call me by. No, it's not. You see, we're finding out in Exodus from the very beginning that God is specific. He has integral specificity within the Word of God. That means that every word that is recorded here is recorded in its integer exactly as it is meant to be. Don't let anyone try to add to it. Don't let anyone try to subtract to it. It is what it is, where it is, the way it is. Our process of study is called integral specificity with which we know by way of the Spirit of God inspired within us to give to you that has the Spirit of God within you that you can hear what it is that God is saying to you about the words that are written here to make them without error because they apply perfectly to you. That's how it works. It is accurate to that with which the Spirit of God causes it to be accurate to you. There are no errors when you have the Spirit of God reading it, saying it, speaking it, communicating it, you hearing it, you understanding it, and you applying it all by God, His Holy Spirit, who does it to us, with us, in us, and through us. So it's not my interpretation or my application or my gospel or my commentary. It is the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, to the people of God, of the Son of God, Jesus, who is speaking. When they went down to Egypt, Joseph had already prepared a way for them to survive the time of great cataclysm that had come upon the earth. There was a famine upon all the land. What caused that famine? Don't know. What could have caused that famine? Lots of Bible scholars and archaeologists have speculated and said so. But what it actually is, we don't know. We only know that Joseph, by way of his dreams and his being used of God to be sent into slavery, existing in slavery, coming out of prison, being sent into prison, eventually being brought up into the king's court and eventually being made a quote-unquote king over Egypt, so to speak, to save Egypt from its own prosperity and just eating, but rather planning out for a famine that was to come. He was used by God in order to save not only Egypt, but his own people. And that's what God does sometimes, even in your life. He might have saved you to save those around you, and because you're caring about those around you, you will be a Joseph to those that are of your family by you caring about others first, and your family gets saved second. It happened in my life. I wanted to save my family first. I was the first one in my family to be saved. I wanted to get them saved, so I went to them and I witnessed to them. didn't do me any good. It did them less good because they didn't want to have anything to do with me. They thought I was nuts. And yet God had raised me up to be the salvation of my family, but my friends and those within my circle of influence that God had used me to communicate the gospel to and that I was able to influence to cause them to make a choice to come to Jesus. So you see, it's never about you going and getting saved and then thinking that you got to go to your family first. No, Jesus said, who is my family? Who is my brother? Who is my mother? And he said, those that do the will of God. So Joseph was taken away from his brethren who did not believe in what God was doing with him and they sold him into slavery and he was sold into Egypt and he was there to prepare for them who would eventually have to come to him and we'll read that in the story and receive salvation even as he has done in Genesis. He'll do it again through Exodus. He'll bring salvation through a Savior. When we read about a new king, I always think about what we have in America today. You know, America today and Exodus today fit so typically and so perfectly to me with Donald Trump and America. Because here we are in Egypt, which America is. It's in the world. America is like a small, 
microcosm of what's going in the macrocosm. And we see in America, whatever happens inside of America, happens outside of America in the world. And it influences the world and causes things to repercuss or to have repercussions there. So whatever happens you see here, you see there. Whatever happens in America, you see happening also outside in the world. You see kind of like a type of fulfillment in America, you see the actual fulfillment outside in the world. When we see an anti-president that's being raised up like Donald Trump, being a king, like a king over Egypt, that doesn't remember where he comes from, that isn't willing to acknowledge that those immigrants that are needful of a place to stay chooses to forsake his heritage and then make bondage upon the people that are here, then we see him as a type in Exodus. But he is not the actual Antichrist. He is just a type of a man who is led up and brought up into a place of position of authority and power and abuses that and confuses it with what God's will is. The same thing we see that the Antichrist will eventually be raised up outside of America in Europe and he will come up through the political system and be hailed as a great man who has the answers for the world. Donald Trump is obviously not a man who has any answers for anyone, anywhere, at any time because all of his business contacts and his business investments fail. He doesn't know how to manage, he knows how to promote. And a lot of people think that's a wonderful thing. But if you dig beneath the surface, you find that it's very shallow. There isn't a sustainability beyond one generation for him to become anything more than just simply a man who doesn't have God. And that's sad because what we're going to find is that the children of Israel were misled. They were brought to Egypt, brought to the land, brought to there for a particular purpose to exist and to live and to prosper for a season. But because they got prosperous there, they stayed there. Do we know whether or not they should have? Good question. The obvious answer is that eventually what was a blessing turned into a curse. And that's what I wonder if you don't see possibly in your own life that what you thought was good for you is turning into what's bad for you. You thought that you could invest in America or invest in your you know, marketing bubble, you know, with banking and getting, you know, six or seven housing projects going and flipping houses because you saw it on TV. And then suddenly you decide that you're going to be the Christian house flipper, you know, provide housing supposedly and then give a tenth of it to the Lord, you know, so that you could stamp your Christian seal of approval on it and that God is going to bless it. Well, now we got Donald Trump pulling off the controls on banking systems and we're going to see the same bubble and burst problem that we had before, only with what he's doing now, this could be the great financial crash that unfortunately some people have predicted may occur. The promises of God were always there for the children of Israel to follow. Unfortunately, they are going to learn and they're going to be assimilated here in this land. All those that had followed Jacob, all those that had been and had become the children of Israel, they are eventually going to be assimilated by the land. They are going to become more Egyptian than they are Jew. They are going to become more likened unto the world than they are the children of God. Because so far we haven't even seen God give them a commandment. We haven't seen God give them the Ten Commandments. We don't see a pre-Noahic flood type of covenant being made. There is no flood covenant being made. We simply see that God has taken Jacob and is sending him down into Egypt in order to be spared. And Joseph has been the rescuer. So there is a type of a savior being taught. There is a type of knowing that they are the children of the Most High God, but there's not any commandments yet to be followed. There's not any mitzvot. There's not any real law, as some people say, to be seen. So when you say to me that you know that you have this legalistic kind of perspective about the law and the prophets and you want to follow legalism, then I say to you, well, what did you do in Genesis before there was the law? Was there a law to itself? Or was God the law and you already knew it because it was written in your hearts, only you forgot it by being assimilated into Egypt? So you see, we have something here that's very interesting to look at. What were they like before the law? What were they like before they were delivered from Egypt? What were you like before you were saved? That's what you're looking at right now. You're looking at the children of Israel now are in slavery. They're in bondage. They are cruel taskmasters making them work harder than they've ever worked before. Oh, you're not like them. You only work eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, and extra time, you know, and you make your wife work, and you work so you can have your standard of living. 
Isn't that what the children of Israel did? Their standard of living was changed. They started off with having prosperity. They started off with having all these possessions until one day the king forgot anyone or the reason why they were there. That they were not slaves, but they were a threat. And suddenly, oh Christian, if you've been supporting Donald Trump, are you part of his quote-unquote followers that, you know, he likes you? So he hasn't picked on you yet? Or are you going to become, just like here in the children of Israel, attacked by him soon? Because you'll have to realize the man is doing evil in the sight of God. You'll have to make a stand to choose one way or the other. But the prosperity doctrine say, oh no, we can go with him. We can just say, bless him, bless him, take the money and run, honey. Because that's what they did. They just simply said, he is a Christian, he's born again, he's saved by God, give him time, he'll prove it. No, he won't. Any more than you see here that the prophecy will be fulfilled, that the children of Israel will have to come out of Egypt, even as later the same prophecy will be fulfilled, when Jesus has to go into Egypt and be called out of Egypt. Just like the prophecy will be fulfilled that you have to come out of the world, or out of your Christianity that you created that is more like the world than it is to be a kingdom of God. So in this, the first 14 verses, the first 15 verses, we see a setup happening. First there was like, oh, only a few. Then it grew and they got bigger and bigger and bigger and became a threat. Isn't that what Christianity represents in some ways to some people today? Are they more of a blessing or of a curse? Are you that with which God has called you to be? Are you faithful and true to go even down into Egypt and be a slave down there and to suffer and to even die before the promise is fulfilled? Because I got news for you. It's going to be fulfilled in our generation. We are going to see the return of Jesus Christ. We are going to see a Savior, even as we're going to read it in Exodus, we're going to see a Savior come and save us from ourselves. Save us from America. Save us from Donald Trump. Save us now in this generation from the great tribulation that is going to occur. Most of Christians will go into the great tribulation period. It is possible that about 2.5% of Christians today will go at an event we call the rapture. They will be taken away, snatched away, rescued, delivered from that time of Jacob's troubles that's coming upon the, all, the whole earth in order to try them and to test them. Some people say, well, that's the wrath of God, so they can't be there for that. No, the wrath of God's coming, too, in the midst of uh, Jacob's troubles. But guess what? You'll probably die before that, so don't worry. It'll kill you before you ever get God's wrath poured upon you. Sorry. Fact of life. You had a promise and a blessing that you didn't have to go under the curse. But if you do, you'll go under the curse and you'll die for your faith. The choice is yours today to prepare yourself to be ready. But it's interesting is that in the midst of all this affliction, in the midst of all this king not remembering, we see also in the book of Acts the same thing happening. We see in the book of Acts when the church was started that they went through their own exodus experience. They were at one time, you know, in Jerusalem and they were safe, but then they were pulled out of Jerusalem and the church moved to where? Rome. And then they were under persecution and then Caesar after Caesar after Caesar threw them to the lions threw them in the Colosseum, caused them to die, killed off all the apostles, one by one tried to remove the name of Christ from the earth, even destroyed scriptures and scrolls and Bibles and books and anything that had even a hint of them being the disciples of Jesus. And yet, even as it says here, in I believe verse 12, the more they were afflicted, the more they prospered. And so it was in Rome too. Likewise, the more that they were killed off, the more they became obviously influential to those that were killing them, to where they got saved. Your enemy became your friend. Your enemy got saved. Now, wouldn't that be the same way today? Shouldn't it be for us who are saved that even our very enemies would be saved by the lifestyle that we've chosen and the way that we live our lives and that the very fact that we're willing to lay down our lives even unto death, we would influence those who would be killing us day after day brought to the lamb as a slaughter, or brought to the those that slaughter the lambs as a willing sacrifice, are you or aren't you? I mean, the, we've already seen how there are people that really want to be a part of Egypt, you know, I mean, prosperity doctrines, people that, you know, obviously want to get a part of the president, you know, be a part of his administration. 
and are sitting in his own cabinet doing what? That's a good question. So for us today, as we wrap this up in verse 15, it says, And the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifroth, and the name of the other was Pua. And the reason why these names are picked out of all the midwives is because they're going to have to put themselves in a position of, do we obey God or do we obey man? And that's an interesting position because you're going to find yourself in that same place. But remember, of all the midwives, which are people that are helping people getting born, and there was abortion going on in this, you'll see that. They were killing off the, the children of Israel. That there is a plan and a purpose to the abortions going on. There is a plan and a purpose that even today in America, as abortion was here in America and still exists, there is something behind it that God is going to do. There is something more than simply getting rid of abortion clinics. There's something more than dead babies dying and going to hell. Most babies do. What babies are saved, only God knows. But don't tell me all babies go to heaven because they don't. You're going to see that in this, the book of Exodus, where it's true. Not all of these babies are saved, but one will be, and he will be a savior to his people. So, ending this now, recognize when you're reading it, recognize when God is putting it in place for your life to live by, that you don't follow pharaohs, you don't follow men that are listed here, you don't follow systems, you don't expect investments in the land to buy your house and think that it's always going to be okay in, in Gishon. Yeah, Gishon. Gishon where they prospered and they grew and they had more and more children, but that the fact is, sooner or later, the promises will come true. Whatever God has said, He's going to do. And if that means that you're going to have to go through a tribulation period or the great tribulation period, then you may have to. And the book of Exodus is going to bring that to you very clear and very obvious that we're living in the time of Exodus, even as we're studying it through Exodus, the mini Bible series, Exodus 1515.